Right. Um, positive daring. What I'd like from you, the audience, the people who have bothered to turn up here, are some short, sharp questions. If you have any intention of giving a paper on which we're going to give a vote of thanks, don't. Right? I'd like to have the females involved, because often the females ask some very challenging questions. Um, you've heard some great speakers. Uh, I am delighted that we've got Sean Rickard on the, on the platform. Uh, I've been with Sean on many occasions over the years. Uh, you, not everybody agrees with his views, but by and large, the thread of what he says, as much as some of it is unpalatable, um, it, it tends to be in the general, general direction. Uh, I'm disappointed that we haven't got Richard North, because I understand he was uh, the person who wrote in private eye as muck spreader. And some people have uh, called me his brother a shit spreader. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we've had some great speakers. I've got uh, Ewan from Kite. You know all the other three. Rob, uh, Rob Harrison from NFU Dairy Board. The floor is yours. I have got some questions that have been sent in, only about four or five. So if it goes a bit boring, I'll, I'll lob an odd hand grenade in and liven things up a bit. Right, but the floor is yours. Stick your hand up. I think there's are there some real big mics. No? Yes, there's one over there. And if you've got a big mouth, don't bother with one. So who would like to be first to just discuss anything that's been talked about this morning? Neil Parrish is sat at the back trying to hide, right? So we might rope, rope him in. Uh, or anything to do with the dairy industry that's relevant because we're organic, we're, we're uh, conventional. Um, so who's, who's, who's going to kick the ball off? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll kick it off with Sean Rickards, right? This is a really simple one. About 12 years ago, I was on a panel with Sean Rickards, and when he, we mentioned organic, he, ra he knows what's coming now, right? He rather controversially commented that we sell more cat food than we do organic produce. Is that still the case today, in this audience? Almost, yes. <laughs> Answer that, yeah, I do. I want to know if we, say, if we now sell more organic produce than we do cat food. We do. Organic uh, produce is a niche market, we should never forget it. And I, I, I use that as an example in public speaking. It happened years, really. So much so that one day when I was at Healy or something, we saw an association, they presented me with a tin of organic cat challenge today on that show because most of the organic people in this room will keep quiet and keep their heads down. <laughs> right, who's, who's next? Yes. working 
If anybody else wants to jump in, just say, otherwise I'm going to keep rattling through the questions. Right, gentlemen there. <clears throat> Does the panel agree that organic will always be a small niche market if the use of fossil fuels in artificial fertilisers were to be taxed at the rate of, say, £20 a tonne of carbon? Would that bring parity in costs? Or what price of carbon do you think would bring parity in costs between organic and non-organic? I think we'll start with Richard Hampton on that one. Uh, my, my view is, um, you know, organic is, I mean, you're saying 1.4. I mean, we can talk, I mean, the, the, the statistics fly around between 1.5, 2, 3, 4, 5% of the market. Point is, it's tiny. Um, would it get to 20%, 30%, 40%? Don't know. But whatever it gets to, it will be a hell of a lot bigger than it is today. When it comes to the question of taxation of things like fossil fuels and should we say other changes to the to the regulatory regime which may uh, which may change the game somewhat don't know because I mean let's just look back at three or four years ago when oil was at 130 140 dollars a barrel it really changed things and everyone was saying well we'd never get back to I mean, the era of cheap food is over remember that statement the, um, uh, you know, and it's come back with a vengeance for, for conventional dairy farmers. The era of cheap energy and cheap oil is over, and it's come back with a vengeance. Um, so I think that um, my view on it would be, we'll just get on with what we do. We know where our advantages lie. Um, you know, the, 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 it never ceases to amaze me that the conventional dairy industry, with everything that is, that is so good about it, and the professionalism and the low-cost opportunities we have in the UK, still manages to have a billion pound annual trade deficit, for example, whereas export, whereas uh, organic has a substantial uh, trade surplus associated with it in the case of dairying. So, you know, we'll just get on with the bits that we, that, that we can influence and can do well, and we'll see where it takes us. John? Yeah, I think uh, it's a good question. Um, sort of 1.4 percent. Yeah, it's a niche, isn't it? And, and I think the, I think I'd agree with some of the things that Richard said. I think the, the organic market will grow. Um, is it going to be 10 percent, 20 percent? I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure it matters too much. I think Pink Lady Apples have shown that you can be 1 percent. They're less than 1 percent of the world market, and it's a very successful business. So I think sort of just growing for the sake of growing and sort of, well, we must get to 10 percent, 20 percent. I'm not sure that's the right aspiration to have. Um, again, sort of lessons from the Pink Lady organisations sort of that they have this system, that the, the grower benefits, the exporter benefits, the importer, the retailer, the consumer, everybody benefits. How do you get food, food chains working together? Well, that's, an, that's, another, that's next year's conference, uh, Ian, probably, isn't it? But it's, uh, um, yeah, there's some transferable lessons there. And I think also in, in the UK, so it's 1.4% overall. If you look at things like vegetables in Waitrose, it's 20%. So in certain, by six, I think if we just talk about the market, it will be 1.4%. I think if you look at customer types, even segment customers and all these sorts of things and do some proper marketing, some categories in Waitrose for vegetables, 20% is organic. So that's, that's, that's worth going for, isn't it? But you've got to understand the, the customer and the consumer. And I think the other thing, sort of 1.4% in, in, in the UK, okay, that there might be a natural limit on that. 1.4% in China, hmm, that's worth having. And some of, the, some of the size of the organic markets, we tend to get a bit UK centric, some of the size of the organic markets in uh, you know, sort of the, the, the brick markets or whatever they call them, the, the, the N11 countries, they're gonna be really big. And that, that can't be anything else but an opportunity. Uh, so the opportunity might be outside the UK. Right, so from the, uh, from the pink corner on my right, we're going to move to the rainbow corner, where I think there's going to be an opposing view that you two are wrong. Sean Ricard, don't let me down. 
<laughs> what a tie, eh? Sorry, gentlemen there. In the, in the why, do we, why do we feel we have to be the world? Why, why do we have to own this to actually go out and be the rest of the world? When we don't make any acts? We live in a global world these days. Our whole uh, economy here depends on being able to compete in the world. If we shut ourselves off from the world, I'll tell you what will happen very quickly. This country will get much poorer, and people won't even have as much money to spend on food as they do today, and your industry will be poorer. You cannot think like that. Anymore. I know there's a minority in this country who think like that. They're just plain wrong. They've got stupid meaning. You need to think about <laughs> operating in the world as a whole. And you have a potentially successful industry here, and you have an industry that can be part of that. But don't turn your back on it. That is not saying that. Sorry, I'm just going to go to the pink corner because they want to come in again. Yeah, look, I think if you look at UK agricultural production generally, so in most, com in most categories, we're about 1%. Um, you know, you always find one that's a little bit higher and one or two that are a bit lower. We're about 1% we're about of everything, really. So we're not going to feed the world from the UK. I think sort of feeding ourselves is, is, is a pretty good objective. I think where we, um, where, where we can contribute to feeding the world, and there is, I think, there's a sort of a... Mo you know, moral global citizen sort of uh, responsibility to, to, to that. We know what happens when people get hungry. It's not, it's not a pretty sight. Um, where we can help is the use of our uh, expertise and technology. I'm, I'm lucky I've been all around the place with Promar. What I do, I find that people still, uh, they think a British education is good um, for, all, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, they think British technology is good, British science is good. We may have under, you know, we, we sort of see it warts and all maybe, Sean, but um, and maybe we haven't invested enough in our R&D and science. And t but, but people around the world think British education, British expertise, British technology is good. And that's where we, so I think, so I think we have a responsibility to help try and feed the world. I don't think we can do it from here, but there's also an opportunity there for us again, surely. M maybe our expertise in organic farming is very good. Maybe I am we going can to come back to that point, actually, on how good we really are, because mm. we think we're marvellous, and I'm not sure we are that good. Who's on the left? Hi, uh, Jonathan Pratt from Yo Valley. Um, I've got be interested to get Richard's comments on um, what, what can be done to facilitate the process of meeting certifi uh, certification requirements at farmer level um, on a broader scale. So, you know, if you look at the opportunities in China, there's massive sort of um, just the, it's red tape to try and get a sort of a, a branded dairy company to, to export an, an, an organic offering. Um, and it seems to me there's, there's quite a few bodies that could get together. What, what can be done to try and make that easier? Yeah, good point, because I have to know that Dairy Crest have had a similar situation with their demineralized whey powder uh -huh. in, in terms of getting certification from Chinese. Richard? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, it's one thing to have Chinese certification on the conventional products. It's quite another to have Chinese certification on organic products. I think, look, I mean, it's one of these areas where... Um, 
there is the there, there is what to do for the good of the industry, and then there is what we can turn to a commercial advantage for ourselves. Um, the way to get into places like China, and China is an area I'm a little bit skeptical about, actually. I think there's a lot of people talk about China as a great area to, to trade, and actually, I'm not sure how many people are actually making good money. I can think one or two in, in the Chinese market. There is no substitute to just a shed load of hours spent researching and plugging away over months and months and months to get yourself into that position. That's how you, you enter those marketplaces. There, there really isn't a, uh, a you know, expertise to fall back on. It's just, it's just good old fashioned hard work and graft to, to learn how to do it, to find the people uh, to, to, to partner with, to get you into those markets. Um, and and that's, that's how we've approached all of our developments. You want Rob? Uh, I, I think so. So it's, it's really important that as an industry, um, we actually work together when we're trying to grow exports so that when we're looking at trade delegations coming in uh, from other countries, that actually we, we have a coordinated process of, of, of making sure we sell kind of UK dairy uh, to the world. So, and that will be opportunities for individual companies, but together we've got it, and that's what we're not doing that well enough at this moment in time. Right, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm expecting some more questions from the floor, but I'm going to bring one that, that came in on an email, one from James Robinson. I'm going to have to add a little bit to it, just to uh, add, add a bit to it. It's probably applicable to most of the panel. The majority of UK buyers are owned from overseas. The question states, First Milk and Omsco are the exceptions. I would have to add into that Dairy Crest and United Dairy Farmers, who I now believe are the largest indigenous co-op in the UK. Should we be worried about the lack of UK money invested in the UK milk industry? Now, your, on, on your seat was a magazine, and the headlines on, on one of the articles in, in uh, Farm Business is attention to detail helps Dutch dairy farmers outperform UK herds. My, my question is, this is the second time in 48 hours I have been faced with Danish and Dutch people, not on dairy, suggesting that they're ahead of us. Do we need an influx of Dutch and Danish farmers and, uh, and the likes to come in and show us how to do things? Because what happened with the pig industry was we exported it. We sat back, we watched processing capacity close, and now we are dominated on pig meat by EU imports. Do we need those Danes and Dutch to come in? Or are we as good as we think we are? Come on then, Rob. I'll have a go to start off with. Um, Danish and Dutch industries are, are different to ours. Um, they've got lower populations, they're net exporters, and they're very intensive industries. So they're all, they're all producing on an intensive level, very, very highly efficient producers. But all, whereas actually in the UK, we, we're, we're here, um, OMSCO are a great example, but we do have a, a, a real kind of consumer uh, need for a range of systems, and I think consumers overall are sympathetic to what we do. So there are opportunities there. Um, obviously, what we can't do is we can't think we're, we're amazing. I think we are pretty good, but we've got to learn from, from others abroad in order to you know, make sure that we do keep improving. And, and we do need, and, and I think it was Sean who said earlier, that we do need investment fr throughout the supply chain. Um, and we, we are lacking, certainly we've had good investment in liquid capacity in the UK. We, we haven't probably had it in, in, other, um, in, in other parts of, uh, of, the, of the processing side. And dairy farmers in general, um, because we have suffered from a, you know, a lack of profitability over the last 20 years, haven't invested as much as our Dutch and Danish counterparts over those last 20 years, and it's going to take a bit of catching up. But at processor level, it looks like we are losing our ownership, right? We've got Muller Wiseman marching across, you're supplying Arla, they've got 25% of the milk in the UK. It looks as if we've been taken over. I'd even speculate, you know, we've got Dairy Crest Liquid, which hopefully this month will go to Muller Wise when that goes. Who knows what will happen to Dairy Crest Cheese, but there's a real possibility that will be owned by a European company. You know, it, it's all moving that we, the expertise and the enthusiasm is coming from foreigners. Right, come on, John Jarvis. Um, I'm going to go to you. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm always a bit surprised when we expect our industry to be owned by Brits all the time now. Uh, I'm not sure. I think the world's moved on from that, really. Um, uh, it would be lovely to think that we all own our industries, but I don't know what car people drive. 
Uh, they're not British anymore. Often they our watches, our computers, and what have you. We, we expect to expect our sort of food industry, which is a manufacturing industry, uh, to be owned entirely by Brit Brits. Uh, I'm not. Sh I'm not, I think the world's moved on from that. I think actually welcoming inward investment is a good idea. Um, if you look at again in horticulture, probably the, the best sort of flagship project of the last ten years is a place called Thanet Earth down in uh, Kent. It's amazing. Uh, it, it's funded. Uh, it's funded by Rabobank largely, um, and it's a con it's a sort of joint venture between British uh, a British produce distribution company and three really good Dutch farmers. Uh, I don't think it would have happened without them. Um, it's we need we need more of those sorts of projects, and I think don't think we should um, turn turn them away. When, when that happened, it was a bit like sort of. Um, when, uh, when, when Arla sort of built new processing facility, people were saying, oh, this is the Dutch coming into the British horticulture industry. They're coming in through the back door. They're going to ruin everything. Have you? They've been doing that for 250 years in Lincolnshire, haven't they? It's, a bit, it's almost like a bit late. Uh, Planet Earth is a fantastic project. We probably need one or two more of them. We should welcome it with investment. You would? Uh, I agree with John. Um, yeah, there are there are not, not many companies now that we uh, that, that, are, that we are um, the, the fortress Europe. Yeah, we are, we can't be fortress Europe, and uh, there's not many com companies that um, do. Um, uh, you know, we do own now, but there is a lot of things that we can do at farm scale level uh, to improve our efficiency and improve our our, um, uh, our, our production. Because as, as Sean said earlier on this morning, you know, we can't be average. We can't be average producers. You know, the difference between the average producer and the upper quartile business. Business is five percent on co uh, five pence a litre on cost of production, and, and everybody's got to strive to achieve that upper quartile uh, level of performance. Because on a million litre producers, a million litre producer, you know, it's worth fifty thousand pounds, and and the milk prices will be fluctuating over the uh, uh, going forward. As Sean said, you know, and and, and, and if, you, if you're a, if you're an average producer with a you know thirty five pence a litre cost of production, then you know. If, if, you're not going to survive uh, at the average milk price of where we're going uh, uh, in the future. Um, so you need to do need to be striving to get your cost of production uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the level of the upper, upper quartile business. Right. Um, our pro-European man at the back is waving furiously, furiously at me, Mr. Neil Parrish. And if I don't take his question, he'll call me before the select committee. Neil Parrish. <laughs> I might yet call you before the select committee, don't worry. But um, no, I just wanted to disagree with you, Ian, totally, because um, does it matter who owns a processing company? Let's use their expertise to actually market our product better. So, I mean, if we did this with all the companies in the UK, I mean, lots of UK companies are owned by other cu countries, and we own companies in lots of other countries. That's the way it works. So I would say let's embrace what the Danes and Dutch are doing through their processing and marketing. I mean, Arla. Is a, is a case in point. I've always said for a long time they've been very successful. If we can tap into that, great. Creates competition, but is that a bad thing? And uh, I, I wouldn't worry where they come from. Yeah, good point. Ge gentlemen, well, the hands are going up left, right, centre now. Gentlemen here on the front row, do you need a microphone? Um, no. Uh, my question is how do you <laughs> rebuild the trust in the supply chain within the UK dairy industry? Because uh, the trust is. I'll be slightly controversial. You said, how can we rebuild the trust? It's like these people that say to me, we need to reconnect. I'm not sure we're ever connected. I'm not sure there was ever a, a lot of trust in, in agriculture, right? But who wants to pick that one up? How do we rebuild the trust, right? Rob? What, what transparency, ultimately, it's just tr about transparency. If people understand where the margins are, if people understand what price they're getting and, and can really clearly see that, um, I think that is, is, is a big builder in, in trust and making sure that everybody is treated, treated fairly and, 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 where, and, and making sure as well that uh, as, as farmers, um, we, um, we're, we're individual businesses and if we can increasingly work together as OMSCO have done and I'll have done and others have, um, then we can, we can potentially have a, a better balance of power in that supply chain. Sure, Richard. Trust is an uh, unusual commodity. It's the only thing whose value goes up the more it's supplied. A long time to build it could be destroyed overnight. If we are going to rebuild trust, it really has to start with people at the power of the supply chain, and that tends to be the retailers and the um, uh, processors. And I spoke to them earlier about Marks and Spencer. They realised that they had to demonstrate they had to take bigger risk um, for their farms because they were in a better position to do it. And the, but they wanted commitment, they wanted long term commitment in return for it. And so I think really. <coughs> Cool.
But with respect, I think there's one or two of our retailers who will remain unknown that wouldn't even know to spell trust, and it's only a little word. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, there on the left. Hi, hi, Ross Payton here. I um, I just like to take issue with Sean Rickard on a couple of points. Just to just to suck it. I was sitting thinking about it. This idea. Organic can't feed the world. Maybe that's true, but I'm a, an organic farmer with a lot of conventional neighbors and some very big dairy herds in Fries and Galloway around about. And I know that my contractors say that the crops of silage I produce are just as heavy as the conventional guys' crops of silage. And wheat can be grown at three tons to the acre without any inputs whatsoever, no pesticides, no fertilizer. If you do it right, if you bring technology to bear, if you use slurry and waste properly and clovers, you can produce just as much. People say, how far did your milk yields drop when you went organic? Well, they haven't. They've got up by 2,000 litres of cow since we went organic. So I, I don't recognize this. I think there's things thrown around. There's a huge amount can be learned from organic farming, if not. I would also say there's this thing comes up. We do, I don't mind organic farms as long as they stop slagging off the conventional sector. Well, that cuts both ways, I have to tell you. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, organic we'll farms have taken a lot of grief over the years. <laughs> I, think, I think we will agree on, on that point that it's, it's both ways. And I, get, I do get personally annoyed when one farmer is knocking another farmer to the point that some farmers even look over the hedge and see their, their, their neighbour's crops down. And they're nearly wishing for the rain to come. Yeah. <laughs> right, who's the next question? Right, chap at the right of the bat. That's going up left, right, and then there's a lady down here. Um, do you think us as an industry have forgotten how to market liquid milk and allowed supermarkets to um, uh, devalue our what is probably the best energy drink known to man? Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw it over if anyone wants to comment, yeah. but I don't think there's any well, doubt at all as to what we've yeah. done. Yeah, I think short answer, yes, isn't it? You know, so, um, I don't, uh, but again, if you look at what, again, let's go back to our Pink Lady friends. What have they been doing? They've been consistently investing in their brand for 20 years. They're out, 20 year overnight success story. We haven't, as an industry, invested in our brands, basically. That's short and short, short answer. Li liquid milk is dominated for liquid, by yeah. a label. Yeah. And, and, and increasingly, retailers are trying to do that with cheese now. So we've got to be very careful. Don't start me on own label and cheese, right? Otherwise, we, we will have, we'll have, we'll have another ha, right. ha, Having said that, for in lots of categories, own label is a brand that consumers trust. So, you know, it's, it, again, you can get this polar as, you know, brands are good, own label is bad. That's, that's again, far too simplistic. But if you, if you want to have a brand, um, there's no point... 20 years after not investing it, turning around saying, oh, well, we should have done that different. You know, you sort of, you know, look, look in the rear mirror and see what's happened in the past and make sure you don't repeat the same milk mistakes so in the future. Milk sourced on cheese that says sourced from New Zealand, Irish and British milk really rattles me and needs to stop. Right. Isn't that where the organic sector wins, though? Because isn't, isn't the organic sector is building itself on brands. You know, it's got some quite strong um, brands uh, uh, rather than commodity commodity milk, the brand section is increasing where the commodity market is, is, is defining in the uh, organic sector. Lady there. Um, yeah, yeah, going back earlier to what Mr. Ricard was saying this morning about the fact that farms are going to have to get larger, um, A, that goes against most of the organic certifying bodies recognition of, of what organic farms are and B, how are you going to convince the local authorities to have these larger farms because they're very, very much against it? They might, I'm going to add my comment, they might be against it, but we all know what happened with Nocton Farms. They ditched their plans, they did very nicely out of it, even sent, I'm told, the crate of champagne to the uh, RSPCA, did very nice out of the deal, and they've gone and built in Hungary. That's the danger that we explore the business book. Sean? We've got to a position in this country, if you think about it, which is rather dangerous. I hope you're listening, Neil. Yeah. Where we decided to structure our industry based on local planning office. Well, I don't think it's the expertise, but I don't think we're ever intended to be placed in that position. And we really need the government to stand up and say, industry structure is going to be decided in a different Otherwise, we are holding back industry. What about to be clear? There's always room for smaller scale good farmers who can add value. But 
dairy farms, on average, are going to become larger, they become more efficient, and if local authorities want to stop that happening in their part of the country, it will happen elsewhere or it will happen abroad. And it's really time the government stepped in and stopped. Some local jobs were mucking on them. I don't think anyone's going to argue with you on that, actually. But no, I've got to go to the chap over the far side and then the lady in front of him. transferable um, added value opportunities within another sector. What we, which dairy category would each of the panels say represents the best hope for a pink lady, <coughs> pink lady in dairy? Which dairy category holds the most hope of a pink lady in dairy? Um, you, you commissioned some research, you commissioned it, didn't you? And uh, some, some guy came to me and, and asked me questions about organic food and dairy, and, uh, and, and, and then he sort of revealed halfway through that the, the client was Omsco. So it didn't, didn't need to be a sort of genius to work out who he was talking about. But he said, what, what should your aspiration for, you know, what would you like your aspiration to be for Omsco? And I said, well, it's not really down to me. I'm a sort of humble consultant. It's probably what the members and the management of Omsco really want. What, what could they be? I said they could be the pink lady of the dairy sector. My, my view on this, I'll answer the question in a slightly different way. Uh, the, the problem you have in milk is uh, consumers just don't think about it. It's just, it's just a, it is the, the ultimate silo shop. You know, you're down the aisle, you pick it up. If you change bottle tops, the colours of bottle tops as an experiment, 98% of the people will go home with the wrong milk type because they don't even read the label. And that's the attitude that you have to change. If you look at the likes of Yo Valley, for example, in the yogurt sector, uh, yogurt sector in general, I mean, it's nine, I mean, they're here, so they'll be able to correct me if I'm wrong, eight, nine percent of the yogurt market is, um, uh, is organic, and that's a function of the branded focus of that particular marketplace against the overwhelming unlabeled dominance in the liquid milk market, uh, which does hold some of that back. Um, so anything for me that, ch that makes consumers stop and think in a category like that, and that may be the, the Neil Darwin free range discussions or, or all those other factors, are probably in the long run going to be a good thing for any value added category uh, in that fixture. Anyone else got a view before I go to the lady there? For, 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 Robert. for, for me, it would be flavoured milks and milk drinks, and there's huge potential to, to add value in different areas and be innovative. Yep. Lady, he was just about to receive the microphone. Yes, hello. Finn Cottle from the Soil Association. Um, to earlier questions about the market, I have got lots and lots of stats, so if anyone's interested, it is 1.4%. However, on dairy, probably well over 5% penetration, which is low compared to other European countries. But my question, too, is about the previous quest uh, gentleman's question. Um, brilliant success story on, on Pink Ladies and equally on Kingdom, but why are we exporting something that we're doing so well to the US, Richard, and you know, to this point about what's the value add for organic dairy. Why not make Kingdom available in the UK and what's the plans for that? Because we are, we are you know, there is room for a, 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 um, an organic cheese, definitely. There's no major organic cheese in the UK market. Um, there's certainly plenty of good quality niche cheeses, but uh, why not make Kingdom available here? It's such a success. Richard. Well, I mean, that, that's a whole new debate. I mean, remember, we, the, the, the most important statistic to remember with a discussion like that is we're uh, 16 people. So at the moment, we're governed by our resources and the priorities that we have. Um, UK opportunities, I mean, th there's clearly lots and lots of them over time. Um, it's a question of priorities at this moment. Let, let me tell you, I'm, I've been speaking to two cheese producers who make organic cheese in this country, and it might believe it or not, be easier to sell it into the US than it is to sell it to UK retailers. Believe you me. Who's next? Right, chap here. I'm, I'm a man talking to uh, farmers every day and uh, half of them tell me that there was uh, government. government organisations like local authorities, national government, European government to step away from the industry, let the industry find its balance. It's a little bit what I'm hearing today. Um, the other half say they want more regulation, they want more controls, more regulation. I'd like to hear the panel's view about whether they want to see the guy at the back doing more for us or step away and go and do something else. Right, straightforward question, more or less, have some snappy answers and then we'll get on to the next question. More? 
More, more regulation from Richard. John. S slightly less. Slightly less. Less, but have a level playing field. You've got no chance. <laughs> <laughs> That's a less. Uh, less to increase the competitiveness of the industry. Less. Less. Overall, yeah. less. Yeah. Mate, less. Definitely. <coughs> yeah, I'll put the regulation. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I, I've, got, I've got one I'm going to throw in. Um, it links with what Richard said about certification standards needed to get abroad. We had a very interesting logo launch by Arla, who now buy 25% of the milk in the UK. That logo is not a unique, a UK specific logo, it's an Arla logo, right? It, it links with all the Arla's image and, and Arla Garten and everything else. Does the panel think that that logo conflicts with the red tractor? In other words, are we walking into a trap with that logo in 25% of our farmers supporting that logo and it links to what Richard said because for me you know Red Tractor's had its problems but we need one logo that's recognized and, and I worry that you know we might be walking into a trap with the new Arla logo which I think is a great idea great differentiation but does it allow Arla to get in with other uh, products from abroad from other Arla farmers there's 13,000 of them at the end of the day my view, um, we see it in the organic sector, um, particularly with uh, some of the regulation that's come in, the multiple logos, the multiple standards that have to be achieved. So, I mean, the, the short answer to the question is, it is inevitably going to conflict because there's now no longer one. The question is, to what extent that will conflict, uh, I guess will be a function of what products it appears on and how good the comms are relative to uh, what Red Tractor provides versus what uh, the, the new Arla logo provides. Yeah, I think you can bet your life that Arla will have a very good comms team. You supply Arla, yep. you support the logo in a way. Yep. Does it conflict? Um, we need uh, we need to simply... <laughs> Hold on, you've been having lessons from Neil Parrish, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, Red Tractor is really important. Red Tractor is um, all about standards, um, and, and again, Arla Gardens about standards. It's very similar to Red Tractor um, with a couple of extra standards as well. But that means that we can take British products and sell it to, you know, potentially to, to other products as well to, to, to be certified as, as Arla Garden. Um, in terms of, of the Arla mark, um, that's, that's some of that's sort of about fair trade, so it is different. Um, but we've got to be careful that we don't cons confuse consumers. Right. Anybody else want yeah. to come in before I take another question? Yeah. Yeah, John. Yeah. Um, I think consumers can understand what two, one logo, two logos, three logos gets a bit complicated. Isn't like you know, I remember a boss of mine said once, John, you can be in two places at once, but three is a bit more tricky. Um, so um, again, if you look at Pink Lady Apples, what's one of the features? Same logo. Doesn't matter whether you're a grower in New Zealand, South Africa, Chile, US, you use the same logo. Global branding, global brands will don't want they don't want people using different logos and, and you know, even small modifications just confuses the consumer. I think Red Red Tractor has been good overall. Um, one or two people don't like it. One or two, you know, Sainsbury's decided a year or so ago that actually Sainsbury's meant more than Red Tractor. Maybe that might be right for their for their consumers. I don't know. There's, there's lots of products that are very successful in the UK food market. They don't have a Red Tractor on them. Right, I got, I got one that's probably slightly controversial in this audience before we go to that, that question uh, across there in the alleyway. Um, DEFRA have now got the, uh, the pot of aid money out of the uh, five, uh, what was it, 500, oh, yeah, 500, million 500 million. euros, right? The UK has got 50, about 28 million pounds. 28 million, right? And it's going to be shared across the board, simply, right? On production, yep. right? Is that right? Because, you know, at the end panel, it was 50. Yeah, yeah, the 15, sorry, yeah, good point. Glad you are here. <laughs> 15 million in England, right, being shared across the board, right? So, you know, organic farmers in this room don't really need that, that share, that money, right? And neither do the aligned farmers need that money, right? I've definitely gone for the easy option. Should the money be more targeted? to the people who are most in need, 
or are we are we thinking that offering some sort of uh, charitable Samaritans? You know, should it be uh, spread equally? So. Yeah, you can. Right, I'm going to go to Sean Ricard, who I guess wouldn't even pay the money in the first place because <laughs> believes, and there's, there's some merit in this, that paying out any money just delays restructuring the inevitable. Yeah, Sean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not my question. My point <laughs> made. <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you get money like this, the truth, you're absolutely right. All it can do is delay it and maybe send the wrong signal to some people that are kind of being conceited and stop wasting your money. <coughs> Yeah, look, all, all around the world, when industries de deregulate, whether it's uh, UK dairy, New Zealand dairy, South African fruit, and these other Israeli fruit, there's, there's usually a period of sort of extreme turbulence afterwards. I'm always amazed that we sort of don't, you know, sort of, and this is, that when it happens, we say, oh, crikey, we weren't expecting that to happen. If you look at the history of deregulation, you get the, these sorts of, um, sort of, yeah, b b bumpy market conditions. So um, I'm surprised they didn't have the money tucked away for a rainy day anyway, to be honest. Um, uh, giving it to everybody. It's like, look, the transfer of lesson. My mum, she's great. She's 85. She doesn't need a TV license, free TV license, but she gets one. Um, so I say, mum, I'm not going to give you the free license. Oh, she'd get a bit up, upset about it, really. She doesn't really need it. It's nice to have, isn't it? But people, so I can see all the reasons why it's being given to everybody. Um, if I think you probably might go back to a sort of a, a, a a backward step and say, let's look at the process of, for, for, for a process that took almost 20 years to organise the removal of quotas, sort of, hmm, did we do that as well as we could? We have plenty of time to think about it. I'm not sure the implementation of that has been as well as it managed as well as it could have done. If you wanted to send it, I'd, yeah, if you didn't want the money, you could put it into R&D, you could send it to something like Send a Cow in Africa. I think the removal of quotas should have been done over a lot longer period. Uh, Dan Lennon. <laughs> Right, I've got four minutes left because I've got to finish your quarter past and then you've got 45 minutes to get your food and get to the toilet, splash and dash and get back in here. Right, <laughs> gentlemen there. Yeah. My question to the panel is, every dairy farmer in this room pays levy to the uh, HND. Um, there are a few sheep farmers in this room as well that we pay to Ebelex. The Ebelex money's, I think, raised about 15 or 20 million pounds, and we've got people working in Hong Kong, France, and I think the Middle East. Does the panel think our le dairy levy money is spent well, and how would it be improved? Does the panel think that our dairy money is spent well, and could it be, should it be improved? Who wants to tackle that one? 
I could. <laughs> I, I could, but I think I'd cause World War Three. Who, who wants? Does anyone want to tackle it? Right, go on then, Rob. Right, so you, you, uh, you heard earlier Amanda started as, uh, as a new chief uh, for AHDB Dairy. Um, so there has been a big restructuring process in place, um, and hopefully that is a, is a new start to, to push things forward. Um, I think we, what, some of the things you've mentioned, and, and, and we've talked about exports, and OMSCO are very good at it, we do need to look at market development, and that is something that the, uh, certainly the, the beef and sheep sector have been very good at. But one of the things that they, they get money paid to by the processors as well, and, and, and as dairy farmers, we're the only ones who put the money in. So, but it's important that we, we look to access and develop new markets. But there is a trade, trade envoy in, in the Far East, um, paid for by DEFRA and AHDB, um, that's looking at all sectors at this moment. So. I would just personally urge, sorry, that the people that email me about AHDB and AHD Dairy, and from an earlier conversation, Ben Briggs from, from Farmers Guardian, would also contact AHDB Direct, yeah. instead of just us. You can have a quick word, but you're not giving me a sermon. No, I was, I was going to endorse what you said. All right, sorry. Please email me as well as Ian. That's yeah. 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 Right, John. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. Any organisation in the world spends its money perfectly, probably not. Uh, if, you, if you find one, please let me know who it is. Um, Pink ladies. Pink, well, yeah, well, look. Uh, yeah, they're, they're probably as good as... Yeah, they're, they're not bad, but they, they, they probably will say over the years we've not spent our money, you know, always on the right things. They, they, they've not been afraid to fail. Um, whereas I think sometimes in sort of UK farming we sort of, fa you know, failure is bad, whereas I think sort of Pink Lady might say failure is part of a learning, as long as it's not a catastrophic failure, they say sort of failing occasionally is part of a learning process and that can only make us stronger. No. Well, I, th I think, yeah, well, so what I'd say is that I think, yeah, the winds of change are blowing through AHDB, that's, that's clear, we're sort of in a completely new management team there basically, so maybe the money will be spent, but actually... The people who can help AHDB decide where they want to spend the money is you lot. So if AHDB aren't spending the money on what you want them to spend the money on, you go to Amanda, don't you, and you tell her. Basically. So, so there, is, there, is, there, is a, there is a bigger responsibility. I think currency is going to be the biggest issue effect, um, affecting our industry and affecting farmers because the reality is you can be the most cheap and efficient farmer in Europe, but if your Irish competitor has got a 30% currency advantage, you're not going to survive. And I think that George Osborne, you might like him or not, is a very strong chancellor. He has fiscal controls that the European Central Bank would only dream about in the southern Mediterranean. Um, I'd like to hear the panel's um, ideas and solutions, maybe, for farmers that are probably going to face a very, very tough two or three years, giving our European competitors maybe a 25 or 30 percent, or even worse, currency advantage, and what the political types in the room, such as Neil and Rob, um, what they're going to do to help us. Well, I can see Neil Parrish nodding his head to your question there, Richard. Who wants to tackle that? Sean Rickard. Well, you're right, of course. I mean, we don't control the exchange rates. We're in a global world where they jump around. And um, well, look, I'll just say this in passing. There's no prospect of joining the euro in the foreseeable future. But one of the so-called advantages of that is to take away the currency fluctuations of people operating in Europe. And outside Europe, something that's not said very often, we have one of the worst records in terms of currency stability. I think Turkey is the developed or semi-developed country. Turkey has a worse record than we do. And it's true, you can be a really efficient producer, you can be doing everything absolutely right, and then for, because sentiment changes, you know, they like the look of old um, Osborne or whatever, you know, people pour in here and the pound goes up and your sales go down. Uh, but I'm afraid, as the world you live in for the next at least 10, I can't imagine you'll be back on the agenda for more than 10 years in this country. So the long and short of it is, that's just another reason for the volatility you're going to have to put up with in the short run. Sorry, but you can't control the exchange rate. 
Anybody else want to come in on that, on Richard's question? Quick one. Yeah, Rob? We, we, we've got to try and develop, I suppose, trade relationships with countries outside of Europe that have better kind of currency parity with ourselves. I think, I think also, yeah. look, uh, exchange rates is all part and parcel of exporting. Uh, if you don't like it, don't do it. Um, where, where, we, where, we can, where you can make up sometimes exchange rate fluctuations is free trade agreements. Uh, the New Zealanders, the South Africans, the Latin Americans, they spent a lot of time uh, developing free trade agreements which gives them preferential access to the market, which means that they're perhaps a little less exposed to uh, exchange rate movements. Europe, we haven't done that. Again, I, if I'm sort of sending a message to Brussels, I say get a move on, please, quickly, because that's what, that's what, that's what might keep us. If, if there's a t tariff difference of maybe anywhere between 10 and 30 percent, that, that's what will keep you out of the market. Exchange rate is almost sort of part and parcel of the bumpy ride of exporting. We need more free trade agreements from Europe with the real key emerging markets in the world. I'm going to draw a line. I'm sorry, we could, we could go on a long time. I'm going to leave you with one thought from me, and it's a, it's a personal thought I've got, and it, it probably uh, is, is more applicable to the likes of Richard Clothier. It's on, on cheese. Nationalism is not the answer, but cheese is a huge problem in this country to the milk price, to the extent that I've been told that if we were consuming British cheese and no Irish cheese, the difference would be a billion litres of milk that would be consumed. I'm not suggesting nationalism is this answer, but we have to stop this multi-milk uh, um, origin labelling. It's outrageous, and the consumers at the end of the day will dictate what retailers do. If we can get consumers to buy British, I'm not saying we can consume our way out of this problem, but we can help ourselves, because you've only got to look at the papers today. Dairy Crest, one and a half pence, off David Stowe branded cheese, Lactalis 1.2 pence down on the 1st of November. We haven't stopped coming down, right? And the branded people are under as much pressure as the non-branded people, because they're getting squeezed, because the money's got to come from somewhere. I'd like to thank the panel, and I'm now going to hand over to Mr. Lyndon Edwards.